Where's your other half? Where's your other half? Where's your other half? Good morning. I think it's about time to begin. Hope everyone had a good holiday. You got plenty to eat. Not too much to eat, like I did. I saw a bill on the Facebook that said, Don't forget to check your scales back. <laughs> Yeah, don't forget to set your scales back 15 pounds. That's a good one. I'm not sure that would cover me or not. Okay, let's start with a prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for you. Uh, this week that we've had to, to take time off from work and to spend time with family and, and with friends we've, uh, and to remind us to always be thankful, Father. We have so much to be thankful for. Father, we... Uh, pray that you'll be with all of our sick, uh, those who are recovering uh, from surgeries. And uh, Father, we pray also that you'll be with the families that are caring for them. Pray that you'll give strength to all and that you will give them back their health. Father, we pray also that you'll be with those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, that you will comfort them and that, that we will reach out and, and try to be a comfort to them as well. Father, we I uh, pray that you'll be with us as we begin a study this morning, that you will open our hearts and minds to your truths, Father, and uh, that we will uh, take what we discussed this morning and, and make changes in our life if we need to. Father, we are so thankful for your son, for his truth that he brought to us, and uh, for his sacrifice and his example that he gave us. It's in his blessed name that we pray. Amen. Okay, so we uh, finished up. The Holy Spirit, almost finished up the Holy Spirit. We're going to move on this morning. I think we like one piece of fruit, getting it all talked about last week. But um, wanted to start something new. On my count, I think we've got five weeks until the first of the year. We're going to start the Jesus study. Randy's going to start that. And so I, I picked something that I'd done a few years ago at Kiowa. Uh, it's based on a book by David Platt. Uh, he's actually one of my favorite writers, uh, the book Counterculture. And um, today we'll kind of talk about what it's going to be and uh, lay some ground rules, if you will, some guidelines that we should follow as we talk about some of these issues and uh, in kind of the 10,000 foot view of, of where we're going to be going. Our society and our culture is becoming more and more divided. I don't know that anybody would argue that. Um, or would you? Now, let me ask you all. What about the divide is it from Jesus? Well, I would I say so too. You know, I have I have these discussions with clients that come in and they call me worried about the latest headline they've seen on the news and worried about the direction our country's going and 
And uh, I find myself reminding them to get some perspective because, yes, it seems like we're as divided as we've ever been. But we've had a civil war, yeah. right? I mean, we're not on the brink of war north and south or east and west or middle versus the coast or whatever you may be. But it seems like, if you're living in the middle of it, that we're very divided, right? Um, along lots of fractures. Political, certainly. It seems like Democrats and Republicans will never quit bickering. Uh, it's just not going to happen. And that's filtered down through social media. I think we feel it more, perhaps, than we have in the past. Um, religious. Are we divided more religiously? In what ways? Okay. Huh? Okay. Okay. There's a lot, and that's really what we're going to be talking about is is these issues that are challenging us as Christians, and that's putting us in conflict with culture, with the world around us that the world has accepted, right, that, that we can't. And so, yeah, along those lines. Now, in terms of Protestants and Catholics, Christian and is Islam, I mean, those have been around for centuries, right? right. We're not talking really about that. But in how we uh, relate to the world if we're a Christian, okay? Race? More divided? Still divided? This has been a hot button issue for the last two years, three years. It seems like it's really been at the forefront of newscasts. But I think it's important to remember those are newscasts, right? Think back to the 1950s and 60s. Are we more racist than we were in the 1950s and 60s now, do you think? Depends? I don't, I believe most people, if you can take away the media and the politicians that use race to accomplish their goals, most people are less racist in, a, in general. I don't think we're living in the 1950s and 60s or even before that in terms of how we relate to one another on the basis of race. Yes, yes. Now, are there, is there still racism? Yeah, there is. Uh, and it's, it's kind of shifted this term systematic racism, okay? And maybe we need to talk about that. Um, but in terms of how we relate with our neighbors, we're not out burning crosses. Nope. At least, I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Okay. More interracial marriages. Yep. We've learned to relate to one another out of, yes. I don't, I believe in my heart that we are less racist now than we've ever been as a nation. Here in this country, you're right. You know. Um, but it hasn't been that long ago that six million Jews were exterminated. Right? So it's still out there. Um, class. This is economic class, I guess I should specify. Rich and poor. What do you think? More or less divided? Statistics will tell you more. Uh, there's a bigger disparity now between the rich and the poor than there's ever been, mostly because there is so much wealth. Okay. People, we are richer than we've ever been before. The poverty, when you have nothing, that can't go any lower. Wealth, we've accumulated more and more and more of that. Okay. Does that make sense? So there is that disparity. We're going to talk about poverty, uh, I hope, before we get done. Geographical. North versus south. 
<laughs> uh, no, not now. It's more East Coast, West Coast versus the flyover states, I think. Urban versus rural. So we have some geographical differences that divide us. Okay. Um, and to move on from that into actual issues, marriage. We're divided over marriage in this country. Okay, so it started. It started with uh, same-sex marriage going away, where it was more living in convenience, and then we've we've dealt with the issue or dealing with the issue of same-sex marriage. Okay, but it still deeply divides us if we're Christian from the world, right? So we've got to we got to deal with that. Abortion. This has been around for a long time now. Still divides us though, along all these lines over here to some degree. Over on the other side, poverty. Already mentioned, racism. Sex in all kinds of facets there. Now, some of these issues we're very vocal about as Christians. Okay? Some, not so much. Um, and this class is really about how we, not the right or wrong of it, I think we're probably going to agree on the moral position of all these issues we're going to talk about, but how do we respond to the issues in terms of relating to the world around us? What should be our approach as a Christian when I'm dealing with one of these issues with a family member or with a neighbor? Okay. Um, our culture tells us to be tolerant and respectful, politically correct, woke is the current word. I've heard this week that that's already a... Pot the past term, we don't even use that anymore, apparently. I don't know. Well, don't it's already out of use, so don't worry about it. Um, if it doesn't affect us, doesn't hurt us, then we should remain silent. That's what the world tells us. That's what our culture tells us. If it's not affecting you, then why are you concerned about it? It's none of your business. How should we respond? Go on the offensive. Take the example of the Westboro Baptist and show up and protest at places. Cause a scene. Be proactive. Start a campaign. Defensive. Stay huddled in our church house. Keep our heads down. Hopefully they won't bother us. Neutral. Take the cultural position and say, as long as it's not bothering me, then I don't really care what you do. That's the question. What do we do? It's not easy to answer that. The class is not going to be so much, and this is the warning, okay? Not so much about what my opinion is or what your opinion is. It's the only thing we need to concern ourselves is what's God's opinion of it whatever topic we happen to be discussing. And believe it or not, there's no new issues. He's dealt with all of them before, right? We think we're unique, and we think it's a bit worse now than it's ever been, but it's not. It's simply not, okay? Um, we're not going to agree all the time. We're just not. We're going to talk about some issues that I'm not going to see it exactly how you see it, even though we're brothers and sisters. But And that's okay. I welcome the debate and the discussion. We can't grow without debate and discussion. I can't learn unless you teach me something. Right? It's okay, as long as we do it in the context of love and respect and trying to learn. Yeah, fine. What I was going to say is exactly as the Bible says Speak the truth and love. You know, yes. Whatever it is that we have. Absolutely. So, just just fair warning. Just keep everybody keep that in mind. All right. I will try to keep that in mind. <laughs> um, 
I want to give you an example of kind of this happened to me this week. So I'm preparing this lesson, and I've got the word homosexual in the lesson here somewhere. Now, <clears throat> Word, I use Microsoft Word, and it's great. It pulls up, it's got an editor function. It pulls up and checks my spelling. It checks my grammar. It checks me for conciseness. Geez, if I was a college kid and had Microsoft Word, my English score would have been so much better. Okay. Because it, it finds, when I tell it to check it, it finds 100 mistakes in, a, you know, in one lesson. Well, there was a new one come up this week when it come across the word homosexual. It gave me an in, in, inclusivity warning. Okay, that inclusivity that I shouldn't use the word homosexual. I might want to consider the word same sex attraction. That irritated me <laughs> that Microsoft took it upon themselves to correct my view of that word. Okay? No big deal. I left the word in there just to show Microsoft. Okay? Come on down a little bit, and there was another phrase, man and woman. Exclusivity. It didn't blink. It just comes up. And it says you might want to consider using, some people might find this phrase offensive. You may want to consider using the word people instead of man and woman. Again, irritated me, but I left it. So I go to Thanksgiving with my family, and we get to talking about politics in some shape or form. Uh, it was all good. It was, it was all right. We're all on the same side pretty much on my family. Um, but I brought up this, what happened to me doing my lesson with this Microsoft exclusivity, inclusivity warning. And I learned something. I have a nephew that is a counselor. Okay. He's a high, he's a licensed counselor. He works in a high school. And before that he was a, a youth minister. And, uh, he said, I understand what you're saying. He said, but as a counselor, I prefer the term same-sex attraction because same-sex attraction is a problem. Homosexual is an identity. Okay? And if someone is labeled as a homosexual, I have a much bigger problem helping them with that because they see themselves as that's who they are. Same-sex attraction is a temptation, a problem that we can deal with and separate from their identity. You with me? I learned something. I learned not to be so irritated <laughs> because that's real. And he's dealing with it on a real basis. He's got high school kids that feel this same sex attraction that he's trying to help with that. And if they've already been labeled by their peers as a homosexual, then, then he's got real problems, right? And how to deal with that. Steve, can you help me there? I mean, does that come? Is that, Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, it never occurred to me. That's kind of what this class is about. Maybe open our eyes to a new way to look at some of these issues that we're going to be faced with. And we're all faced with them. We've all, if you want to, same-sex attraction, I'm going to try to use that phrase more than homosexual going forward. But we've all got family members that are dealing with that to some extent. We all know somebody dealing with that. Dean? What I was saying is, I knew mean, well, I had this kid in class, and he was in the class with his friend, and they were talking Yes. Yeah. 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 And I, I can understand how it's so much harder to deal with it if you think that's who you are rather than that's a, a problem just like any other problem that needs to be dealt with. So just a, I, it was a real life example that happened to me this week. And I wanted to share that 
it's a good example of what this class is kind of about going forward, how we're going to deal with some of these issues. Now, um, now back back up to 10,000 feet for a second. What's the most um, offensive thing about Christianity to our culture, do you think? Judgmental, okay? We're judgmental. Condemn people to hell. They think we're better than other people. We think we're better than other people. Okay? Fair. Okay. We're guilty of some of those things? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> some of that's true. Right? Um... It's not so much our views on homosexuality or sex or marriage, okay? Uh, the truth is, actually, the gospel itself is offensive to people. Now, I'm going to spend the rest of the class kind of explaining that, but and it, it sounds a little bit like an oxymoron to say that good news would be offensive, okay? Um, but before we can deal with these individual issues, we need to understand the bigger issue, Okay? Um, in the beginning, God, the first thing that man finds offensive about God is that he exists. Okay? That he created us and that we ultimately exist for him. We are not masters of our own universe. We're not masters of anything. And we don't like it. That's what we find offensive about God. The world finds offensive about God. We're not free to do what we like, what we want to do without consequence. That's what Christianity teaches, right? And we don't like it as human beings. He's holy, he's pure, he's good, perfect, omniscient, omni-everything. And we struggle to even understand and argue and debate about what good is, let alone what perfect is. We want to trade places with him. Genesis 2, 16 through 17. And the Lord com commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now we find just in these two verses here, uh, examples of God's holiness, goodness, justice, and grace. Okay? Uh, because of who He is, He has the authority to find what right and wrong is. He's what pours meaning into that word, good. Okay? And right just based on who he is, okay? Um, he lays out what the rule is, what we're going to be judged by, and that is obedience to him. And he explains it to us in his grace. He didn't have to. He explains there that this is the consequence if you do not obey me. And he provides a way for man to live happily. All you got to do is stay in obedience to me. I've provided everything you need. Okay? And how does man respond? Within a few verses, man is tempted. Did God really say? Okay, this is the tempter's words. You will not surely die. God knows you will become like him. And the tempter's questions lead men to question, is God really holy? Is God really good? Does he really know what's best for me? Right? And so what happens there? It gets turned upside down. The roles get reversed. Instead of God judging us, we're judging God. Instead of him asking the questions, we're asking the questions. And we get things upside down.
Now, all those, that temptation, as you all all know, revolved around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, what's so wrong about knowing the difference between good and evil? We want to know the difference between good and evil, right? But the tree, that was the knowledge of good and evil. Well, it turns out it's not that there's anything... As a kid, I used to think there was something magical happened when they ate the fruit, and their eyes got opened, and they knew the difference all of a sudden. I don't think that's the case anymore. The actual meaning, the Scripture there, goes from knowing the difference to the determination of good and evil. Okay, what's that mean? Okay. It moved from God having the authority to determine what was right and wrong to man having the authority to determine what's right and wrong. And when they done that, they violated God's standard of good. And that's really the only standard that exists. Okay? You with me? They judge for themselves. They, they judge for themselves. We'll decide what's right and wrong, what's good and evil based on my wisdom and my situation. In the moment that I'm being tempted, I get to decide what's right and what's wrong. Whatever the situation calls for, I get to decide. Because every situation is different. I'm not the same as you. And you're not the same as me. So why should you be deciding what's right for me? I get to decide. And certainly God shouldn't have any input into it at all. You see the problem? And this is why the world finds Christianity and religion in general offensive. Okay? So, what happens when you remove an objective, holy God who's given us a definitive right and wrong standard that's eternal, that doesn't change, doesn't waver, and you remove that, and you let man decide right and wrong for himself. Well, before long, nothing is inherently right or wrong in and of itself, or good or evil. And so what you find is that it's good and legal to rip a baby from a mother's womb. Think about that. It's good to rip a baby from a mother's womb. Isn't that what we're told? I, it's my body, my right. I get to decide, not you. Not free moral agent to decide right and wrong. Free moral agent to choose between the two. There's a difference, right? There's a difference. We don't get to determine. We get to pick. Okay? But our culture believes that it's good, that abortion is good. Do they not? That's the argument. They're always going to argue what's good. That's the, always the argument. Whatever side you pick on, your argument's the good one. It's legal and good for a man to marry another man. I should be afforded this. I love him just like you love your wife. I should have all the same rights and privileges that you have. Shouldn't I? It's good that I'm able to do this. It's legal and good to raise and sell and smoke marijuana. It's sitting close to home right now, isn't it? It's good. Medicinal use. People need it. We ought to provide it for them. And what happens is, is we end up with Caitlyn Jenner being female of the year and Tim Tebow being ridiculed for his 
prayer. That's the culture we're in. Because right and wrong has got turned upside down. It no longer exists in our minds. There's no standard of right and wrong. It's whatever is good for me. And if it doesn't hurt you, why do you care? Yeah, Jerry. Yes. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. That's that's because we're making the decisions and not God, right? Um, the moral philosophy for most godless worldviews, if you remove God from your worldview, is do no harm to others and be true to yourself. Is that fair? That's what the way the world sees things. Now, if, you, if I'm harming, even the world says, if I harm you, they've got a problem with that. You, can, you don't have to have God as part of your moral compass to say that's wrong. Okay? Agree? Yeah. Most people agree that I can't hurt other people, no matter what religion or worldview I subscribe to. And be true to yourself. Whatever makes you happy, as long as it's not hurting anybody else, then that's okay. Right? Sounds good. It really does. It sounds good. Who gets to define harm and what extent can you go to be happy? Who gets to define harm and what extent can I go to be happy? The pornographer will tell you that he's providing women a way to support themselves, even to become wealthy and independent. And besides that, he's providing a service that our culture needs. Obviously, it's the, one of the biggest industries in our nation, pornography. It's not hurting anybody. I'm not going to get any pushback on that. Y'all are afraid to, aren't you? How many marriages has it hurt? Hadn't hurt the pornographer. How many marriages has it hurt? How many young women has it hurt? Yeah. A lot of times we see pornography and we'll be a coexisting disorder with something else that is conflating the other disorders. Okay. 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 It's got a real addictive uh, consequence to it. Yes. Yeah. I read a statistic that more money spent on that in the United States than all other countries combined. Yes. I, I wouldn't doubt that at all. Your teenager can, without any restrictions on their phone, can pull up pornography right here. Now, we've got the internet hopefully locked down so it can't happen in the building, but if they've got a phone service, they can get it. I shouldn't say teenagers, it can be kids for that matter. Yeah. Jerry, do you have some? The definition of who defined to me is quite simple. The definition comes from society, not from our thoughts and believing in God. And that's the problem that society in general has. Yes. They want good, not what's right. Yeah. What's good for me. Correct. Right. Yeah, hopefully that's the case. But what we're finding is, is that society is having an influence on us rather than the vice versa. And so inside the church, these issues have crept in. And that's the reason we've got homosexual priests. I'm sorry, priests that suffer from same-sex attraction. That are sanctioned by the church officially. Okay, and so we've, as Christy said, or somebody said, we've removed the right and wrong from it, as you're pointing out. It's no longer a question of right and wrong because that priest deserves to be happy. Okay? Now that's even the scarier part is how do you define happy? 
What happens when the child molester is not happy? Yeah. And then who's harmed? You see? Yeah, it's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. There is, it'll be legal within our lifetime, I think. Uh, there was a, there was a major magazine, I think Vox published an article on it that we need that we need to see it as just as like any other attraction. Okay, now this is where I need to we need to pump the brakes. It's going to be so easy for us in this class to take off on these things because I want to. I can't even hardly get the class together because I'm thinking about, oh, man, I'd like to talk about this, this, and this. That's not the point of the class. The point of the class is how are we going to respond to these things as Christians, as in our efforts to save the world and to spread the gospel. Okay, We've got to keep our focus. And that's so the conversation I had with Steve the other last Sunday, I think. It's so easy for us to lose our focus because we want to talk about the right and wrong, and we get emotionally involved. And when we do that, it's so easy for us to forget who we are and why we're here. All right. And that's that's really what we so y'all will probably have to bring me back to the center on that from at times. But um okay, enough said on that. Um the sin of self, Romans 3:23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gospel says that evil is not limited to certain types of sin and certain groups of sinners. Evil is present in all of us and therefore part of every culture and every civilization. Okay. Um, we've been created by God and we've been corrupted by sin. Everybody. And so we need to be reluctant to segregate people based on sin. We want to do that because their sin's worse than ours, but we need to remember that we've all have sinned. We are able to think, choose, create, love, and worship, but we are also able to hate, covet, fight, and kill. Human beings are the inventors of hospitals for the cure care of sick, of universities for the acquisition of wisdom, and churches for the worship of God. But they, are also invent, but they also invented torture chambers, concentration camps, and nuclear arsenals. This is the paradox of our humanists. We are both noble and ignoble, both rational and irrational, both moral and immoral, both creative and destructive, both loving and selfish, both godlike and bestial. John Stott. We need to remember that about ourselves, okay? as we try to help people with their problems first. We need to remember it about ourselves first. Um, I'm pushing through a little of this kind of quick. We're just like Adam and Eve in the garden. It looks different in our lives, but this, on the spiritual plane, it's the same thing. Do we want to determine what's right and wrong and what's good and evil rather than letting God define that for us? and being thankful that he has done that in his wisdom. Okay. Um, the essence of sin is basically, if you boil it all down, is the exaltation of self. Our language is filled with the word self. Okay. Self-confidence, self-gratification, self-promotion, self-pity, self-centeredness, and this is not near all of them. Self-indulgence, self-righteousness, and the word that's going to bring about the end of civilization, the selfie. Okay, and I've already, we've talked about that before, so I won't bore you with that again. But that's just <laughs> such a perfect example of the problem, right? You turn the camera on us because we're the most important thing, right? Rather than focused on our, our neighbor and on God. Um, and we, as we've mentioned through the, our study of the Holy Spirit, 
the orders clearly defined for us, God, neighbor, self, right? The culture turns that upside down. It's self, then our neighbor, and then maybe God. Uh, it reverses the order. Um, got a couple minutes here. Is Jesus unique? Now we're going to dial down to just the Christianity itself here uh, to finish up. Anyone that knows anything about Jesus would agree that he is a good man. Even the most secular atheist will give you that, that Jesus was a good man. Okay, um, He's easy to identify with. His sorrow, his struggle, his suffering, um, that's what makes him makes him such an attractive figure. But at the same time, he set himself apart with these wildly egocentric claims in Scripture. I am the good shepherd. You are the lost sheep. Okay? I am the light. You live in darkness. You are thirsty. Only I can quench your thirst. You are sinful. I can forgive that sin. You're guilty. I'm going to be your judge. John 4, 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. His death is unique among religious leaders because the death is the point of his story. All other religious leaders, you pick the religion. I don't care who it is, which one it is. The story ends when they die. Jesus' story doesn't really start until he dies, right? That is the story. That is the story. Um, the cross is the central symbol of Christianity, symbolizing that death. Uh, we celebrate his death each week with the bread and the fruit of the vine. Why is his death so significant? He rose again. He's what reconciles us back. Okay. Even though we have worked so hard to separate ourselves from God, and we've been determined to define what right and wrong is, what good and evil is, Jesus is the only way back to God. All right? It's the only reconciliation. Is there. He's the only path. Just like he claims, that's true. You put these three fundamental truths together. God is the creator, owner, and judge of every person, alive or dead. Again, these are things that culture does not like. Every one of them stands, every one of them stands before him guilty of sin. They don't want to hear that because we're judgmental, right? And the only salvation is faith in Jesus, the crucified Son of God. God and Jesus are offensive to the world by their very nature. They don't like the story. Okay? And we have to understand that because that's the first hurdle we have to get over in order to be able to talk to them, in order to be able to share the good news with them, is they find it offensive from the get-go. And we have to understand that coming into the relationship. Okay? That's kind of the basis, the foundation on which we're going to approach these topics over the next few weeks. All right? Thank you.